What is the best ETF to invest for long term, you may ask? In this video, I will answer this question and explain my rationale behind it. In a nutshell, it's any ETF that tracks NASDAQ 100 index. Yes, you heard me right. This video may trigger a lot of people, especially those who believe in diversified portfolio or S&P 500 or dividend investing. But hear me out. Maybe I will give you a fresh perspective on things that you maybe don't know. There are primary two areas that I will address. The first is the future returns as well as risk. First, what is the difference between NASDAQ 100 and the NASDAQ Composite Index? NASDAQ 100 consists of 100 non-financial largest companies that are listed on NASDAQ Stock Exchange. Conversely, NASDAQ Composite Index encompasses all the almost all stocks that are listed on NASDAQ. Thus, NASDAQ 100 has a higher concentration of familiar big tech names. These include Apple, Amazon, Google, Meta, and Nvidia. The top 10 holdings for NASDAQ 100 and NASDAQ Composite are similar. The main difference arises in security selection and their weights towards the tail end. So it's clear that NASDAQ 100 is less diversified compared to NASDAQ Composite or S&P 500 index. But I will later argue that this is a good thing. Next, let's take a look at returns. It's not a secret that the NASDAQ 100 index outperformed other major indices on a massive scale. This graph shows cumulative price returns without dividends reinvested. Even if we include dividends, the massive outperformance does not change one bit. Historically, dividends contributed about 32% of total returns for the S&P 500 index. As for NASDAQ, indices. Dividends were less important. Even if we double the cumulative price returns of S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100 still stands tall. Ok, you say, historical performance does not guarantee future returns. True. And this is where our views can diverge. Here's my take on this. First, in my view, technology companies in general will perform better than the rest of the economy. This is so because technology is playing a bigger, bigger role in our lives. Conversely, S&P 500 represents companies from diverse industries. So I view S&P 500 as a proxy for the general performance of economy. Also, I speculate that the market capitalization correlates with economic mode and better performance. It may not be true everywhere, but I argue that this is true in technology sector. At least this is what the past historical performance is telling us. So this is reason number two of going with a concentrated big tech company portfolio as in NASDAQ 100, as opposed to NASDAQ Composite Index that includes many other smaller companies. The final stumbling block in all this is the risk. And we may differ how we define risk. The standard textbook definition of risk is volatility. You basically take your returns and adjust for the amount of volatility for a given period. So basically, this penalizes stocks or equities that tend to fluctuate a lot, keeping all other things constant. But do you see the problem with this definition of risk? Wouldn't you be willing to hold a stock that grows a whole lot more than the other one, even though it fluctuates a lot on the way? Suppose I tell you that you can choose from two investments to hold for the next 10 years. You must invest and hold them without selling. Also, you must not look at the chart during those 10 years. The returns by the 10th year are as follows. Investment A generates the cumulative return of 176%, while investment B generates 431%. Which one would you choose based on these figures? The answer is quite obvious. Investment B. But what what if I tell you that investment B fluctuated a lot before it earned you 431% return? Would you change your mind? Or rather, would you prefer to keep your eyes closed and get those higher returns? As you see, there is a problem with the definition of risk in the financial industry. Howard Marks, the prominent investor, defines risk differently. He says it's a probability of a permanent capital loss. And how do you estimate that probability of permanent loss? You have to come up with uh, intrinsic valuation. You have to come up with probabilities for different 
earnings in the future and their outcomes and then you have to measure them and then come up with this uh, probability but that's a very subjective and sometimes very qualitative exercise and uh, modern portfolio theory has no place for this because it's just too difficult too subjective but that's the reality of it that's how it really should be done and for this reason i think many investors tend to miss on those excess returns on let's say Nasdaq 100 which outperform many other major indices because many financial advisors are telling them to focus on risk adjusted returns. Investing in indices largely eliminates the risk of permanent loss of capital. This is so because you are investing in not only one or two companies, you are investing in a basket of companies. Second, if any company starts to fail and lose its market cap, it will be dropped out of the index by design from Nasdaq 100. And finally, there is a certain assumption or based on historical performance that markets tend to grow over time. The historical performance is 8 to 10 percent uh, on an annual basis depending on the period. So if we believe in that, then the risk of capital loss is largely eliminated over the long-term horizon. This brings me to two most important points that will make it or break it in terms of investing in Nasdaq 100 and make this strategy work. It may be actually true generally for investing. First, you must have a long-term horizon of at least 10 to 20 years for capital appreciation from Nasdaq 100 to shine. And if you don't have that much time frame, then probably it's not worth even looking into it. Maybe it's generally true not only for Nasdaq 100, but anything else. And second, you must be psychologically prepared to stomach large drawdowns. Large drawdowns, especially in recessions, are very common and they could be 40 to 60 percent. And we don't know exactly how long they can last until the recovery. So it could be four or five years based on most recent experience, or it could be faster, could be longer. So you must be prepared to stomach those drawdowns and be prepared not to withdraw your money. Otherwise, if you withdraw or sell, you will lose on the upside when the stock market recovers. So those two things are very important to keep in mind. As far as the ETFs that track NASDAQ 100, there are really two that stand out and both of them are by Invesco. The, the first one is Triple Q or QQQ and it's uh, little brother uh, QQQM. Um, they both track NASDAQ 100. Um, QQQ has a 0.2% expense ratio, while QQQM has a 0.15% uh, ratio, slightly sl smaller. Uh, but uh, the QQQM is a smaller brother, so it tends to have smaller liquidity. It's still building its momentum, but uh, so maybe there are some problems with spreads when you buy or sell. But uh, it may not really matter in the long-term scheme of things. Also, Invesco ETF funds have a slightly higher expense ratios compared to Vanguard, who have uh, expense ratios of 0.05 or even sometimes they have 0% but still paying a little extra, which is 0.2 or 0.15%, uh, still makes sense in the context of potential returns. This is it for this video. Uh, I hope you learned something new today and this will help you to make a better investment decision. Please give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. This will let me know that you value my input and it helps you to actually make a better investment decision. Uh, with this, uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.